The Speaking of Cults podcast is presented solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from it is at the user's own risk. The views, information, or opinions expressed by the host and guests are solely those of the individuals involved and do not constitute medical or other professional advice. Hello and welcome to the Speaking of Cults podcast. I am your host, Chris Shelton. And this week, I am joined by Mr. Arthur Goldwag, and he is an author of The uh, New Hate, A History of Fear and Loathing on the Populist Right, which was written in 2012, Cults, Conspiracies, and Secret Societies, my copy right here, (laughs) written in 2009, Isms and Ologies, written in 2007, and the Belief Net Guide to Kabbalah, written in 2005. And just this month, in March 2024, he has released his new book, The Politics of Fear, The Peculiar Persistence of American Paranoia. So, Mr. Goldwag, welcome to my show. That's great to be here. Yeah, I am super keen to talk to you. I was very happy to uh, get an email alerting me to your book and and desire to be talked to because uh, I have enjoyed this uh, this book you wrote on conspiracies and cults has been in my library for a long time. You nailed it on Scientology. You gave a nice two page summary of that. And uh, I am a Scientology survivor. I grew up in Scientology and I escaped from that 10 years ago. And I have been uh, doing writing and and research and YouTubing on the topic of destructive cults like Scientology ever since. And I detect, correct me if I'm wrong, but I detect a little bit of a theme running through your work. It's it's an accidental theme. I I, I never set out to do this. Uh, I um I wrote this book, Isms and Ologies, and it was fairly successful. And the publisher asked me to do a follow-up, and I thought of a whole bunch of things, and none of them quite worked. And then somebody said, you know, why don't you do a book about, like, disreputable ideas? Why don't you do a book about non-canonical ideas? And I, you know, so we talked about bad philosophy and stuff, and finally we settled on cults, conspiracies, and secret societies. And... I actually thought it would be kind of fun, and I I, I envisioned a, a much less dark book than what came out, and I also really didn't appreciate the politics of of conspiracy theories and the politics of ideas about secret societies, and even the political implications of the way cults work, and. I learned about it very quickly when the book came out and I started getting hate mail and getting people asking me questions at public appearances. And that led me to this book, The New Hate, on on um on the it, it was also the timing. It was, it, the Cults and Conspiracies book came out exactly as Obama was being elected. And it was a huge, huge watershed moment for the far right wing. Mm. And anyway, so I wrote this book, The New Hate. And then a couple of years later, Trump was elected. And all of a sudden, hate groups and hate ideologies and and the great separation and the the great replacement, sorry, and all these other things were were in 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 the mainstream of the news. And so I wrote this new book saying, look, there's actually a, a, a strand that runs through all this stuff. And that's 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 how I come to you today. <laughs> there, here we are. OK. And I and I guess you have written for New York Times and Salon and various, uh, you know, I'd say some some pretty heavy hitting uh, media. And I and it's not been on this topic of sort of the welding of cultic influence or manipulative tactics, I guess you could say, and it's sort of uh, influence or marriage with political thought in America. Is that kind of where you're going with this? Well, it's it's where I am with this. I my writing career is is again, it's it's not 
the usual career. And I, I never, I never set out to be what I am today. It just happened. I come out of book publishing. I was a, um, for 20 something years before I wrote a book, I was a book editor. And, um, I said, I, being a, a book editor exposes you to a, a lot of ideas and, uh, um, and it, it gives you an unusual perspective, but I'm not an academic and I'm not like a working journalist. I'm a, um, I'm very much an independent thinker. Understood. <laughs> I, 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 I feel, I, I, I feel similarly <laughs> not being connected with any major organization or, or news organization or anything like that. I, I uh, just, we kind of independently do our work, you know, and throw it out there and hope it sticks and hope people take notice. So today there's uh -huh. a, um, in time magazine, there's an excerpt from the politics of fear that's about a UFO cult in the 1950s. So um, presumably people are looking at Time Magazine. It's, it's online and right. suddenly reading about me in connection with flying saucers. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what have you found to be, because you've, you've seemed to focus your attention on um, problems or issues, you know, in the right wing ideological sphere is where it seems you have focused a lot of your attention. How did it go in that direction in the first place? You mentioned the Obama's election and the changes in American ideological thinking and, and the, the communications and the, and, and what was being communicated about it's gotten, you know, pretty conspiratorial. I don't think that's a controversial statement when we look at QAnon and uh, the rise of various other conspiracy-minded groups online and in the real world, and how that's bled over into real-world activity when we look at something like January 6th, certainly influenced by this. I'm not saying it was the only causative element was online culty activity, but it was certainly part of the picture. But how has your view of this been uh, informed by your research? What it, What's gotten you down this, this rabbit hole? Well, two things. I mean... I'm not going to deny that I'm a left-leaning person. I, 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 I don't vote conservative, but that's not how I got here. Uh, what I find is this, this process that culminated in Trump has been, um, you've seen a lot of ideas from the very far right traveling to the middle. Now, there are certainly conspiratorial and cultic ideas on the left. And on the extreme left, you have this thing called the horseshoe theory, where the, the two ends of the spectrum kind of meet. Mm -hmm. um, but it isn't represented in the mainstream. There is a far right caucus in the House. They talk a lot about the far left caucus in the House. And, you know, Trump talks about radicals and you know, radical Joe Biden and so on. These people aren't really radicals. The, 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 um, the, the, the farthest left in the mainstream Democratic Party was kind of the middle of the party 40 years ago. There's been this, this rightward trend in politics. And the other reason I focused on it was because they came to me. Um, you know, suddenly I was being attacked and I was surprised. Um, a lot of the attacks were anti-Semitic and a lot of them, I realized later, were, were kind of based on the, um, on the models that are in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Mm. There's, there's one big group that controls all the money, that controls the media, and its goal is to destroy Christendom. And it wasn't invented by the people that wrote the protocols. It turns out to be much older than that. And the research I've done, it goes back to the 1790s and the great Illuminati scare, but it goes back much further than that. It goes back to Gnosticism and the, the, the early Christians fight with the Gnostics. It's a, um, 
in fact, it's kind of a universal strain in human thinking. And it's, I suspect it goes to the roots of where religion comes from, and the roots of where our ideas about politics come from. I think it's, um, you know, I, th I, th I think we're talking about kind of universal frameworks that, 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 that we come to instinctively. And some people, people that lead cults, use them to 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 control people, um, and not everybody's as susceptible to it. But but the, you you look at the, cults are very very different. But the what kind of unifies them all is is the way they treat people, um, and the way their leaders treat people. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. True that. Well, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said there. So let me ask you a few questions about all of that. <laughs> First off, because, um, yeah, we started it now and then we went all the way back to Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fascinating. So excellent. Um so I guess what I want to ask is, first off, what do you mean when you say, well, there's this sort of, you know, underlying theme to sort of this whole thing that goes all the way back there? Because, you know, where if you start sifting down through details of everything you just described in terms of the timeline of that, there are so many, so many details and complications to all of that. So what is it that you're seeing as this as this unifying thread or theme that runs through this that goes back all the way to Gnosticism? Two things. Um, the first thing is just us and them. Uh, we the, we we are one group of people. We're we're precious. We're we know something. We we we're um, we're good, and then there's this great mass that's threatening us. Um, and then the other thing, which is the Gnostic thing specifically, is that reality is not what you think it is. People have been lying to you forever. Um, everything that you know was wrong. Mm. Um, God. The God that you worship, the God that your church has you worship, he's an imposter. He's not really God. There's the, the real God is above him. The real God isn't being heard. Um, when If you can grasp this truth, it will separate you from the world, but it will make you strong. It will allow you to survive. And so those are the kind of the, the two big strains that I see in this. Got Us it. and them. Okay. Yeah. And and the lies that you've been raised on. Got it. So I, we, we um, I, I would refer to that, or I would discuss that in terms of, um, I think, a term that Robert J. Lifton used in describing thought reform and how it's accomplished is having a core of sacred science, a, a, a core set of values that, that make this group or make us special and unique mm -hmm. and elite. Because we have this knowledge, and of course, Gnosticism, that's right where it goes to is knowledge. And because we have that, we are exalted, special, unique, different, and obviously by implication, better than mm -hmm. everybody around us. And this is core uh, core belief for any cultic activity or group, because you have to rile people up around that kind of special uniqueness in order for them to feel empowered to do the horrible stuff to other people that they end up doing. Mm-hmm. So that and, makes sense to me. And the other thing that I would add is that the, the, these ideas aren't inherently wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of governments tell lies. A lot of religions tell lies. A lot of cults tell lies. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of political movements are um, are wrongly disparaged. They're they're wrongly characterized. A lot of the 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 paranoia that goes into cultic thinking isn't based on nothing. You right. know that the, the, there there are things right. to be afraid of in the world. That's there, right. people have enemies. Uh, tribal groups have have other tribes that they're afraid of. Nation states have other nations that they're afraid of. So it, 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 the, the, these aren't 
bizarre ideas, but it's 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 how um it's how extreme they are. It's and um and in cultic settings, it's how intimate they are. You know how how ingrained into every aspect of your life they are. Um, cult cult leaders don't take all your money just because they're greedy. They take it because that's a way of making you dependent on them. Right, that's exactly right. Uh, codependency. It's all about that. Mm -hmm. um, how that's that's exactly right. So coming maybe closer now to the present because because there are you know we can draw historical parallels or roots to so many different groups or activities or aspects of things that shared common cause with stuff that's going on now or we can relate it to behavior you know they acted the same way or they themed around the same kind of thing that you know these guys are doing now and we can draw those parallels so um, but it's not necessarily, you know, it, it's it's interesting, but it's not necessarily useful to the situation now to go too far back, I guess, is what I'm saying. Otherwise, you start to get a little ivory tower about it all. And people want to argue with you about the protocols of, you know, the elders. of <laughs> um, So bringing it kind of now coming forward a bit, I'm curious, where do you think modern political thinking in terms of it going in this extremist direction? When do we see the start of that as it's currently manifesting? I mean, I could go to Heritage Foundation and, you know, the 1950s and the conservative, like, okay, we got to, you know, we got to push back against all this communism and socialism that's infesting our country through the New Deal and all that after World War II. I understand there was a lot of activity then. We can go into the 60s and the counterculture revolution and the response to that the wild 70s and the oil problems and 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 issues where do we want to how how do how do you see all of this well again i, I want to be a little careful how i phrase this sure um america is a deeply religious country mm -hmm. and part of the reason that religion has thrived in America as it has is because we don't have a state church. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, Thomas Jefferson usually gets the credit for the wall between church and state, mm -hmm. deservedly. But the real architect of that was, was James Madison, and James Madison was a Baptist, and baptism was illegal in a lot of the country at the time. Um, it The... Um, oh. The, 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 the dissident sects in Protestantism were not universally accepted. Um, and Madison felt rightly that you, if, if, you, if you want religion to thrive, you, you don't agree to tolerate other religions. You treat them all equally, which is to say separately. Let, you know, let, let, let them do what they do. And that includes Judaism, and that includes Catholicism. And what I argue in the politics of fear is that um, the, the foundational us-them hatred in America is Catholicism. Um, the Puritans came here. They came here to get away from the Church of England. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, they came here to get away from, from Catholicism. They wanted to live in a country where everybody was a Puritan, and nobody was a Catholic, mm -hmm. because when we talk about this um, this one world super powerful state that has unlimited money and, and unlimited power, you're kind of talking about the Pope and the Vatican. That's that's and I think that's what the model in a lot of this thinking is. Um, that's not the American state. The, the the founders were sophisticated people. They were men of the Enlightenment, and they respected deeply respected religion. They didn't all practice religion. Some of them did. Some of them didn't. Adams was very religious. Washington talked a lot about God, but he didn't go to church. 
Jefferson was probably an agnostic, really an atheist. Madison, as we've seen, was very religious. They they constructed a system that they hoped would 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 allow religion to thrive without having religion control things. Right. Not everybody's okay with that. Right. And one of the things that we've seen, you, know, you say, like in, in recent years, in the, in the last 30, 40 years, is the rise of evangelicalism as a, as a evangelicals as a voting block. Yes. Yeah, not, not, really. not, not all evangelicals. Mm -hmm. I mean, lots of evangelicals aren't right wingers, but mm -hmm. a, a lot are. And when you look at Trump support, it maps very closely to to um, certain kinds of evangelicalism. So that's one thing. Um, another thing that brought right wing conspiratorial thinking to the surface, um, and probably the 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 weirdest and most prominent philosopher of far right wing thinking in the 50s and 60s was the John Robert Welch of the John Birch Society. Mm -hmm. He basically wrote the same things that um, people were writing about the Illuminati in the 1790s. He referred to those books a lot. The communists to him were the Illuminati. Um, mm, meaning the sort of secret new se world order makers, the kind of guy yeah, who were puppet a, a, actors a, for the world. Atheistic very wealthy, um, super sophisticated, um, uh, secular, evil secular thinkers that, that that are looking to destroy nation states, looking to destroy religion, looking to replace their. Um, you can map different groups onto the on onto this, but the, it's kind of that thing. Okay. Um, and then. Forced desegregation, uh, the 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 struggle over civil rights, brought a lot of these people to the surface, mm -hmm. um, added a lot of fire to the movement. So you have you're sort of um, you're sort of activating haters in a way. You're 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 sending haters into the political realm. People that, that don't want their kids going to integrated schools or are, are, are suddenly getting active in politics. And again, some of that maps with evangelicals. Mm. Um, so you have you have the the um Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, the, the institutions that they created were originally created to to be white only schools, white only religious schools. Mm. So I mean, so that that that's that's another strain. Um I think that, and again, I'm I'm not talking about everybody. Um, right. You know, o Obama yeah. won by substantial majorities both times, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of people that were horrified. I mean, he he wasn't just a black man, but he was a black man with a Muslim-sounding name, and it was like a shock. Um, how ha how does this happen to America? Um. And then a, we dare have cultural diversity in this country. <laughs> I know it's 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 so backwards thinking, and yet I totally track with what you're talking about. I've I've spoken with these people and at length, and it's it's it really is a kind of opposite world view where you know if you don't look and act like me, there's something grossly wrong with this entire country. And it, then the you know final thing, which again it, it, it's particularly intense in my lifetime and your lifetime, we've had this vast economic shift. Um, when I graduated college in 1979, 35, almost 40% of the country were employed in blue collar work and they made decent livings. Yep. It's, I think it's maybe about 10 or 12% of people are involved in direct factory production now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of blue collar workers that do fine, but that whole uh, manufacturing route to the middle class mm. is is basically gone. Um, the, the America's gonna be a manufacturing power again, but it's gonna be advanced manufacturing. 
People are going to have to know something about computers. People are going to have to know something about machines. So the, the, um, the high school educated manual worker that, that makes a good living feels very under threat. Right. Um, you look at earlier conspiracy movements, they came out of the heartlands, they came out of agricultural places because the farms were getting mechanized and the farms were turning into big businesses. And farming has never been an easy way to make a living in America. It's a, you can do it at scale and it's fantastically profitable. Factory farms, corporate farms are, are hugely profitable, but farm, ag the agricultural sector employs about 2% of the American workforce now. It used to employ about 60% of it. Mm. So th th these are like huge shifts. Yeah. And, um, and some of these shifts are from something that's more intuitive to something that's much more complicated. And conspiracy theory is intuitive. It, it, it's, it's simple. It, it, it's so clear. It just, and, and I think this is also what people get out of cults, is it, it explains everything. It, 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 it gives you a narrative. It empowers you. It, it, it turns a, a difficult, chaotic life into a story that has a potentially really dramatic ending. It, it takes victims and turns them into heroes. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of that. Yes. Yes. I could not agree with you more. You've come to the exact same place I have when it comes to conspiracies, which is it's it's a simple answer to a complicated problem. Mm -hmm. And often the complications of the problem are so complicated that they defy easy any understanding when you start talking about global, you know, geopolitics and energy, the, the energy problem or energy crisis or, you know, climate crisis, and you combine those things together, you're talking about problems of infinite complexity and, and trying to dive into them is, is really a life's work. It's a, people dedicate their whole professional life to these fields. And, uh, and so to ask the average citizen who's trying to hold down a job, get through their life and not make, and not have, not have too bad of time of it to understand the grand big picture of things is a bit much of an ask. Mm -hmm. So, and the news media doesn't exactly serve up a whole bunch of facts and figures for us to, oh, okay, that's what's going on. It's not like that. So when people are fed information that either doesn't make sense to them or, you know, it's only half truths and untruths and propaganda, and they sense that something's wrong with that, which isn't that hard to do because we have that kind of instinctual knowledge that somebody's kind of screwing with us. Which which they are. I mean, which that's that's the other yeah. thing. We we live in a very competitive, market driven economy, which right. means that there's going to be a lot of losers. Exactly. And a few a few winners and a lot of losers. That's so right. you, you're not wrong if you feel like the the odds are stacked against you. It's it's true. That's right. Life life is full of unfairness and suffering, and there's evil out there too. I mean. I would be absolutely insane. I would have to be a conspiracy theorist myself to believe that all all the ideas of, about terrible things in the world are made up. They're not. You know, there's right. That's right. Just just look at the newspaper. It's, no, there, it's, <laughs> there. These things are the the best conspiracy theories, the best cultic milieu. You know, the best ideas always are built on truths rather than total fabrications or total fantasies or myths because it's it, it's it, it, it because it's a lot easier to debunk a completely made up thing whereas if it has a grain of truth you can always pull up you know well look right here and look right here and look right mm -hmm. here it's all true see well no fact a and b are true but connecting those dots to c makes no sense whatsoever but that's the that's the anatomy of basic conspiracy theories. You take fact A, fact B, and you go to fantasy C. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Is how it tends to go. Dots that don't connect. But it fulfills. You know, my take on it psychologically is that it, is that it serves the purpose of 
fulfilling our emotional needs. We, you know, we want to feel secure. We want to feel that we have purpose and meaning in our life. We want to have our ego satisfied to some degree that we mean something in this picture, that we're not insignificant pawns on a board that is, you know, just being moved and tossed about. So conspiracy theories and cultic thinking and dogmas tend to feed those needs. And I think that's why people glom onto them. What do you think? I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I don't, why don't you tell me your story of, of how you got into Scientology? Oh, well, I, I grew up in it. My parents got involved uh, mm-hmm. as a kid. So I'm a second generation cult survivor. And um, being raised in it means you're basically surrounded by the conspiracy theory mm-hmm. your whole life, right? So you're steeped in it. And what that really means psychologically is that is that escaping from it, like breaking out of that headspace and leaving it is much more challenging than somebody who may be bought into something in their 20s or 30s. It can have, you know, unique challenges being raised in a group like that. But the, but the phenomena of fulfilling emotional needs, a story that makes sense, simple answers to complex problems, those all, those are, all those check boxes are, are, are checked in the, in the same way. Mm-hmm. You know, if you can feed people a narrative that makes sense to them in the moment, in the context of their life, they'll buy it. Why wouldn't they? And if it happens to be that Lord Zenu, you know, uh, conquered the galaxy 75 million years ago, well, I'll run with it because... Because look, it makes me feel happy, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> or it provides some degree of sense and order to my world. And it makes other people's behavior explainable. Oh, okay. It's because of that. All right, good. That makes sense to me. That's all you need. You, you know, that's, that's the bar of entry. And I bought into an awful lot of ideas like that growing up. And so my worldview was, was pretty skewed. Uh, mm-hmm. toward an L. Ron Hubbard sort of point of view, you know, about the idea of how the mind works and how spirituality is and and how it's very, very exactly and carefully defined in Scientology. So I wasn't a loosey-goosey sort of maundering of, well, I'll pray and make it better. There's none of that. No, no, we're we're in charge here. We're in we're cause. We're the ones who are making mm-hmm. things. Happen. And I think that let me let, let me let me turn the question, let me turn back on you. I think that has an awful lot to do with what drives people to believe this stuff is it makes them feel not only satisfied or, or makes them feel like they understand things, but I think it feels, they feel empowered by it. They can now do something meaningful and useful and effective in their life that gives them, you know, that, that fulfills a purpose. And, uh, and when you weld it with, Christian thinking, which they were already raised with, evangelicals especially, a pretty hardcore religious thinking, and you welds to that or marries to that so easily, right? Well, this is what God wants, right? Well, God wants Trump in office. Oh, hey, okay, right? Well, what do you think? I mean, that's the fascinating thing about Trumpism. Yeah. Not Trump. Trump's this incredibly successful con man from New York City. Right. He's, he's unique in the extent of his success and his slipperiness, but he's a classic product of America. I mean, great American writers have been writing about con men for, forever. They're, they're, it's a real uh, American type. Um, you know, the Wizard of Oz was a con man. Right. Uh, and you uh, see, and you see that as a uniquely American phenomenon. Well, I don't know that it's uniquely American, but it, okay. but it, but it, but it is. It is a prototypical American phenomenon. And that yes. you read Mark Twain. There's a, he writes about Conman. There's a wonderful Herman Melville novel, The Confidence Man. Um, it, 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 this is a, a theme. Yes, um, because Amer- Americans can invent themselves. Right. In in the old Europe, you know, you you were you were a serf or you were a lord or you were royalty or you were a priest. You had a place, mm-hmm. and it was very hard to leave that place. Mm-hmm. And the rise of the middle class is what gets modernity going, and America is foundationally middle class. America is a country where anybody could own land. 
unless you were a slave. That yeah. was a, a new, new idea. I mean, that land used to be the, the most valuable thing there was and the most defining thing that there was. Right. Um, and that changes. So, you know, the great Gatsby, another one, people can invent themselves and reinvent themselves here. Yes. And um, so Trump, Trump is Trump is Trump. Trumpism to me, and I write about this in in the politics of fear because I I betook myself to a Trump rally and just sort of soaked it in. And what I saw there was not a lot of horrible people that that would have killed me if they had known who I was. What I saw was a lot of people who were very, very happy to be with each other. Um, very happy to be sharing space with other people that were in the cult of Trump. And I saw people greeting each other. I talked to people. This is the 13th time they've seen him. They weren't that interested in what he had to say. Um, maybe a half hour into his speech, the place was a quarter empty. An hour into it, people were streaming out. And he continued talking for at least another 40 minutes after that, that what people were there for was to be with each other, to see him, to, to get a glimpse of him, to be um, it, 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 the sense I had was it was like a tent meeting. Um, it was like it, it was a place where, where people felt good. Um, now the 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 um the language of feeling good happened to be a language of hatred and exclusion because it was all about how terrible the other side is. But nobody from the other side was there. You know, they they weren't burning people at the stake or anything. They were just saying bad things about them. And I think if you go to a Trump, if you go to a tent meeting, you hear an awful lot of bad things about the devil. And the devil's not actually there. You're there. And um, but what Trump didn't do, I thought, and I was sort of surprised, is he didn't he he didn't answer the need of he he didn't give them a lot of affirmation. And I think this might have been different in 2016. I don't know. I didn't go to a Trump rally then. But in 2021, or 21 or 22, or 22, I think it was that I went to this, um, what he talked about was himself and his problems and his grievances. And it was kind of a pity party for Trump. And I think that might have been part of the reason that people were leaving, is he, he just wasn't saying enough about them. Understood completely. Um I'd like to respond to what you were just saying by reading you something and seeing what you think of this. It was a post, and I'm not going to read the entire thing because it's a few paragraphs, but this was a post from somebody about Trump and Trumpism. And I think it aligns an awful lot with what we were just talking about. And I wanted to get your take on it. And this was the post. Y'all don't get it. I live in Trump country in the Ozarks in Southern Missouri one of the last places where the KKK still has a relatively strong established presence. They don't give a shit that uh, what he does. He's just something to rally around and hate liberals. That's it, period. He absolutely realizes that and plays it up. They love it. He knows they love it, and the fact that people act like it's anything other than that just proves that liberals are idiots, all the more reason for high fives all around. If you keep getting caught up in why they do not realize blah, 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 and how they can still back him after blah, 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 you are not understanding what is the underlying motivating factor of his support. And this is rude, but I'm just going to keep reading. It's fuck liberals. That's pretty much about it. Have you noticed he can do pretty much anything imaginable and they'll explain some way that rationalizes it so that makes zero logical sense? Because they're not even keeping track of any logical narrative. 
It's irrelevant. Fuck liberals is the only relevant thing. Trust me. <laughs> I know firsthand what I'm talking about. That's why they just laugh at it all, because you don't even realize they really, truly don't care at all. Whatever the conversation is about, it's just a side mission story that doesn't really matter anyway. That's all just trivial details. The economy, health care, whatever. Fuck liberals. <laughs> Now, there's another point he says later on, which is also very interesting, which I wanted to specifically ask you about. You got to understand, and this is, and I think this is true, but you tell me, but you got to understand the one core value that they hold above all others is hatred for what they consider weakness, because that's what they believe strength is, hatred for weakness. And I mean passionate, sadistic hatred. Um, sometimes they lump in vulnerability, a compromised circumstance, or an overwhelming circumstance in there with weakness too, because people tend to start humbling themselves when they're in those circumstances. And that's obviously a sign of weakness. Kindness equals weakness. Honesty equals weakness. Compromise equals weakness. They consider their very existence to be superior in every way to anyone who doesn't hate weakness as much as they do. So that's a statement of a central monolithic sort of cultish dogma that underlies all of it. What's your take on that, on that hot take on, on Trumpism? I think it's probably true. Uh, what I would add to that is that... <sighs> Projection is a huge psychological phenomena where you you project onto the people you hate the things that you hate about yourself. Mm. And so you would really hate weakness if you felt like you were weak. Yes. Um, and I think that that is the essence of this thing. Yeah. Once upon a time, rural white men of limited education we're the backbone of this country. Yep. What's happened? Um, people that know about things that I don't know about are lording it over me. And one of the most complicated, never mind abstract physics, never mind foreign languages and, and crazy theories about critical race theory and all this stuff, money. Money is really, really hard to grasp. And people that have a lot of money understand it in a mathematical way. They 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 trade money uh, that doesn't exist yet. They 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 switch different currencies. They 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 match. You know, as Richard Hofstadter said in the paranoid style of American politics, they profit from depressions. They profit from war. They know how to do it. Yep. It's it's a complicated esoteric thing. George Soros is really smart, and um, and Trump is rich too, but he's rich because he's just a strong guy and he he knows how to take advantage of people and he 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 puts it in a way that that people can understand. He he he's not a financier. He right. builds things. He 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 creates value. Um, I think, I mean, I think that that was really well put. Um, it would be infuriating if I was one of those people listening to you read that, because you're basically saying, you know who these people are? They're bullies. And bullies are sad people. You know, the, the, the schoolyard bully is the kid that grows up to be a nobody, yeah. uh, a, the, the local drunk. The, the the local bully, the guy that beats up his wife and 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 gets arrested all the time. Um, it's dark. It's sad. But that's you know, I'm a um, I'm a dictator. I'm a, a a potential dictator looking to take over a, a system and destroy it. Who am I going to call to my side? Or the the people that have a chip on their shoulder? Yep. The people that love to go out and fight, the yeah. people that will just just love brawling. Those those are my brown shirts, potentially. Yeah. Um, not not that these people necessarily are that far gone, um, 
some of it's performative. You know, it, Trump's a TV character. He was the star of a TV show for a long time. Mm. Um, some of it's just, you know, you're cheering. It's like a video game. QAnon is like a video game. It's a world building game. Um, it, it, I don't know that it's hard for me to believe that we're going to go all the way. But as somebody that has studied a lot of history, I know that the countries that have gone all the way there did not know that they were about to go there up until they were there. And even when they were there, they, they were looking for reasons that it wasn't happening. Yeah. And that's very scary. That's right. That's right. That's why I think these conversations are important because I know that it upsets people to talk about this. I've been receiving um, trash talk and hate for many, many years, ever since 2016, when I have expressed criticism or, um, you know, tried to offer some kind of analysis of cultic activity or dogmatic, you know, uh, really extreme sort of thinking and activity in that camp uh, on the right wing, right? And I get told, you know, well, you need to look in your own backyard and the left is just as bad, if not worse. And it's all about, you know, this sort of what aboutism and finger pointing and this kind of thing, rather than just being willing to take a look at the fact that there are real issues and problems with extremist levels of thinking, whether it's on the left or the right or the center or anywhere, I don't really care where you are on any spectrum. Extremism is the, is the giving over of critical thinking to your emotions. It's giving over mm -hmm. completely to this message and the message becomes more important than human, than, than the people around you. That's that. If there's a, if there's a simple summary of what a cult mindset is, that's it. Yeah. I think that's beautifully said. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're dealing with in our political arena. We do see examples of it on the left. I've done whole shows describing cultic thinking on the left, but that doesn't, nullify or really have anything to do with what we're talking about on the right. And when we're talking about political controversy and division and, you know, we now have popular entertainment coming out that is openly discussing civil war in this country mm -hmm. as like, here's not just some fantasy theoretical. Here's, here's what this could look like if we keep doing what we're doing. And that is very alarming to me. I feel I should do something about that. And that's the show, right? Yeah. So that's what drives me in this is I'm not trying to tell all a, a whole class of people how wrong you all are. I'm trying to say, hey, let's stop and put some brakes on and take a look at what we're all doing here. I think we're taking this a little too far. How does um, that messaging fit in with what you're trying to do with your book these days? Well, I try to think of what I'm trying to do because I, I I don't really believe that 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 explaining stuff to people that are beyond explaining, you know, is going to change them. I guess what I'm really hoping is that people that are on the fence, people that well, I'm not that angry, but I'm pretty angry. But it, but I don't really want to throw in my lot completely with those people. Yeah. If they can just see the 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 um the danger of the position that they're in, what 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 the the abyss that they're about to step into, mm -hmm. um, and maybe recognize the humanity of the other side. Um, and like you, when you left Scientology, you cut yourself off from so many people and it, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And I, I, um, I worry about people having to cut themselves off from, cause politics is, um, you know, it's mostly habit. In, in this country. People vote the way their parents do. They vote the way their neighbors do. Um, people don't independently come to their own conclusions. They're sort of raised to think in certain ways. And 
I think half the country was not raised to think like a bully, but they've kind of thrown their lot in with someone that thinks like a bully. And I, I would like them to see how, how, how scary that is. Um, you know, when people ask me what the difference between a cult and a religion is, um, religions evolve and grow and they, um, and no matter how strange they were when they started or how weird the cult leaders were that, that began them and all religions start as cults, they, they they grow and become humane and you have you know islam is a religion of billions of adherents and there's some incredibly extreme terrible people in the mix there was a lot of violence at the beginning but it's it's a culture it's a way of life and for most people it's it, it's it's not that different than for most people in a different religion they they, they want to do well they want to be kind they they believe in charity. They believe in in loving their neighbor, which is very hard to do. And I, if, if people would only like, you know, let 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 go of the extreme parts and hold on to the to the good parts. Yes, I I'm I'm not anti-religious. I um I'm anti-cult. Um, but you know, I started out thinking that this was a failure of critical thinking. Um, people just, you know, needed to pay more attention in school. Yeah. And I realized, no, this is about an emotional, uh, a, an emotional void. Yes. And, and how can you make people happy? Well, societies that are growing and prospering tend not to be as susceptible to these things as societies that are shrinking and people have lost hope and lost direction. Um, you don't look to very happy societies to find these behaviors. So, you know, if 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 we can get on a better track, if if we can be, if there's less um, less inequities in this country, there'll be less of this stuff. Yes, I could not agree with you more. In fact, that that feeds me over to a quote that I enjoy sharing um, from Aldous Huxley that I think could maybe help put us on that path toward a better future um, by raising awareness, I guess, to a degree. Because you're right. You can't tell people who are in a cultic situation, hey, you're in a cult, buddy. Oh, really? Oh, okay. It, you know, obviously it never, it never ever just happens that way, right? It, it, you usually need a, a little bit more um, uh, laying a foundation, I think, is, they, is, is how they put it in, in a court of law, right? You need to kind of lay some more foundation. And I think one of the things that we can talk about with people that might help is how we lose our humanity in the middle of all of this rhetoric and messaging. I think a lot of people can get on board with that idea because they do see it in themselves. They see how they become the worst versions of themselves when they go online and say nasty things to other people. And, you know, that I think that weighs on people maybe way after the fact, but I do, I, I think that, I think that people's conscience matters. And I think one of the, one of the points Huxley brings up is the purpose of propaganda is to make one set of people forget that other sets of people are human. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can really, you know, we, it, maybe we can, maybe we need to go to that level at this point in our messaging of, look, we're all human. We need to be on the same page here. We're, we're, we're all making, we're all having the same struggles and we're finding radically different answers to those struggles, but can we at least agree that we're all kind of struggling and we're on the same page with that? Trying to find any common cause these days is so difficult, but that mm -hmm. I think going in that direction might help us um, formulate thinking that is more goal oriented, purpose oriented, you know, uniting rather than divisive. I feel sometimes a little Pollyannish when I start thinking and saying things like that, though. I don't want to be cynical. I don't want to have an idea that this cultic thinking or that this sort of divisive thinking is is uh that that we're doomed to some sort of cataclysm because of this we've certainly survived similar times in the past without having such cataclysms i can look to the 1960s i've had more than a couple people tell me 
things in the 60s were actually worse than they are now in terms of civil unrest. Keeps my fingers crossed. But what are your what are your thoughts about everything I'm saying right now when we start talking about possible solutions or ways to move forward that might be more positive? I'm scared. I mean, I'm I'm really scared of where we're going. Mm-hmm. Um, but I try not to give into it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I really do try to have hope. Um, I and I when I wrote isms and ologies, my my favorite ism was meliorism, which was a I think the term was coined in the 19th century, but it was the belief that things get gradually better, maybe so slowly that you don't see it in your lifetime. Yeah. But you compare things now to how things were 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and they're dramatically better. And I think of um, Martin Luther's King, Martin Luther King's the 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 Ark of Justice is is. But what it, it it bends it's long but it bends towards justice. That's right. That's right. Um, I hope. I hope. And again, I think Trump is. You know, you could you could write about him a lot, and you probably wouldn't learn that much because I, I don't know how much is there. You certainly, aren't any ideas to write about. But you can write about this type of person. The people that are following him, if Trump disappeared tomorrow, a lot of them would kind of come out of their come 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 out of the spell, come out of their trance. Right. And they feel kind of embarrassed and awkward. And they look for something else to attach themselves to. Or maybe not. Maybe they would just join the rest of the human race. And that's kind of what I hope is is that this is a a transient enthusiasm, as 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 someone might say. Yeah. Um there have been similar times in American history. There really have been. Yeah. Um there was one where things went really, really south, which was the Civil War era. Yep. Um Big successful countries have failed in history. They, you, it, history, you know, the the histories that the founders were reading were the histories of the Roman Empire and the Greek empires, and these were all failed systems. They they collapsed. Yep. And one of the most dangerous things these systems did is they they played with democracy, and democracies are fragile, yep. and democracies can give over to popular enthusiasms that are destructive. So how, how do you control this? Big time, um, big time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I, um, I like, I, I encourage people to be hopeful, but I also, um, I don't want people to be complacent because things could be much worse than they may expect. That's right. I would say that I think people need to be hopefully industrious. I think that's beautifully said. I think that's really the attitude because I think you nailed it just now when you when you brought up complacency, because we can tend to think, oh, okay, I don't need to worry. Therefore, I can glide. Mm -hmm. No, you don't need to worry because you're doing the work (laughs) that we all need to be doing. And this is part of it is trying to get a voice, trying to bring some bring some education or awareness out there about this stuff is is very necessary. I think you're absolutely right that we need to be focusing on the positive. And the fact of the matter is that when you ask almost anybody, okay, what time period, what place would you like to go back to and live the rest of your life? You know, if you really think about that question for a minute, not just some kind of, oh, I'd love to go be at a Greek orgy or something, right? (laughs) Like really think about it. Most people that I've spoken with about this, once we start talking about toilet paper and, and, and uh, you know, electric stoves and microwave ovens, right? They start going, and vaccines and disease and hospitals, they go, oh, no, I'd stay right here. Thank you very much. This yes. is the best of times. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's like, I want to go where they have indoor plumbing and, <laughs> and, and you can get your kids vaccinated and they don't die. Exactly. Um, half, half your children don't die, which is more, more than half of children used to die routinely. Um, and that's also, you know, that was the, that was the, with vaccines, it's funny, you know, George Washington ordered the troops to get vaccinated against smallpox. So that was, it was a brand new vaccine. It was pretty dangerous. It was, you know, it was a, it was cowpox and a certain number of people died from it. But he was so scared that they were going to lose the whole army to an epidemic. Yep. that he ordered them to do it. And he told the anti-vax people, you know, you have to think about the safety of the whole. And it's kind of amazing how our modern problems are not particularly modern. You know, the, 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 there has always been this struggle against um, paranoid thinking and and... and thinking about the group that's thinking, right thinking about the whole that's right i yeah uh, so many parallels in history so many analogies to be made um and we can and and that's sort of that predictive factor that's so wildly out of control with us with conspiracy theories is okay well i'm going to take this and this and this from history and i'm going to connect these dots now and it's all going in toward the direction of what mostly doom and gloom. There aren't too many conspiracy theories that are real, that have happy endings, you know, um, or endings at all, really. It's very interesting how so many of them are sort of, well, there's just this big nefarious plan and I'm in on it now. So I'm emboldened and empowered because I have the secret knowledge. Well, what do you, can you, what are you going to do about the Illuminati? Well, nothing. Nobody can really do anything. Of, you know. Well, then what's the, you know, like uh, the, the earth is flat. NASA's lying to us. It's all a government operation because the devil. And you just go, okay, so what am I supposed to do with this, right? Pray, okay. You know, like it, <laughs> it doesn't really go anywhere either, which is something that I think needs to be pointed out about so many conspiracy theories and cultic dogmas is, and I'm totally equating them. We've been doing that the entire show because they are basically the same thing. You, you, you there there's these are not messages of hope these are not messages as you said the politics of fear this is fear mongering I, that's I what was, so much of this is built around I was talking to my kids a couple of weeks ago about why there's so many science fiction stories about a return to eden or a, a, a mythical place that we all came from and i said because we were all children at one time and our parents were perfect, and they loved us, and we loved them. And then things changed. And I mean, not everybody was beloved by their parents, but even people with abusive parents think that their parents love them. And that's the hardest and hardest thing to deal with about a child abuse is that the, the children don't even know that they're being abused. They're, right. they're being destroyed, and they don't know it. Yeah. And we will not ever in our adult lives be as happy as we were when we were six months old and being breastfed or coddled or whatever. But there's so much we can do to be happier than we are. <laughs> and, you know, you can choose an alternative where you have all your answers and all the love and all the meaning, but none of it's true. Or you can choose an alternative where you do stuff and are engaged and are here and present. And that's what we have to do. Right. That's right. I think I think the only sort of um, caution or what, I, the, the word I'm looking for here is sort of like, I think the only thing we shouldn't be doing, I think the only thing that that we tend to gravitate towards, which is really our kind of undoing at a personal level and at a group level, is our proclivity towards bad news, towards conflict, right? We want that. We somehow need to need to find that. It makes evolutionary sense. It's threat assessment. Your brain's built for it. It's gonna, it's gonna tune into threats three or four times harder than it is to, you know, non-threatening, beneficial, complementary stuff. 
But somehow we've got to fight that urge. It's a discipline. It's like you said with, you know, you originally, we think, I thought the exact same thing, by the way, um, you know, critical thinking, that's where it's at, right? If we can just teach everybody in schools how this stuff works, everybody would respond and, and it would be wonderful. But that's not really the picture. It's it, We are emotional creatures who think, not thinking creatures who feel. Exactly. And that's kind of where it's at. You realize that it really is all about emotion. And that's when you realize that propaganda is a tool that cuts both ways, right? You can, you got to feed the masses with something. They have to have some message to get on board with so you can feed them the truth and try to go in that direction or you can feed them a bunch of lies. But it doesn't, it, you can't really tell by the effects. People can respond to lies just as much as they can respond to truth. You can't really tell that way, right? So what you have to do is just kind of get a keen interest in the truth and in facts and that's where critical thinking is useful but the emotional component of if you don't satisfy people's needs if you don't make they give them some goal and purpose and meaning they're just not going to be so interested in listening to you for very long you know mm -hmm. and i think that's what trump glommed on to in 2016 with some of the messaging that he had then i think his enablers were were, were feeding him very good things to say to people and and they were like biting and now it's come down to, you know, it's like, it's a little bit on autopilot in some ways. And I think, uh, you know, where people are just showing up to see it, it's more of a religious ritual than it is a political rally or, or thought filled activity. I, I, when I was think? researching this book, I found online the, um, the playbook for Trump university. That, that, that the instructors had to read and a line leaped out of it at me. He said, look, you're not selling a program, you're selling feelings. And I thought, well, that's, he, who, who, who knows that better than him? That's right, <laughs> nailed it, nailed it. That is the cunning sort of thing at the, at the center of, of, of that grift. Um, and I, I, you know, and I, and I know I offend people when I say stuff like that. I, I just don't know what else to say. It, you know, I have to call it like I see it. Um, okay. So that all being said, um, do you see, do you think, you know, you want hope? I want hope. We don't want to be pessimistic. Have you ever checked out it or looked at, um, Steven Pinker? Or uh, there's a European researcher. I think he's published a book called Factfulness. These I, I, know, I know about the Pinker book. Yeah. I have I haven't actually read it. Um, <laughs> better he's, he's, better he's angel a, nature. I I I read several of his books and I've met him, and um, I've read several of his wife's books and I've met her. Um, and he's he's a kind of a piece of work in a lot of ways. But he's there. There's there's a lot of truth in it, and it's counterintuitive. Yes. I mean, he 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 looks at the 20th century, which we know was just soaked in blood, just soaked in blood. Yes, and he says actually, it's one of the best centuries we've had, <laughs> which tells you how much blood was soaked, you know, in all those earlier centuries that we actually just kind of blow off or don't think about or don't even know about, you know? Yeah. And when, when you, when someone comes along and says, follow me and things will be as happy as, as they were in the good old days, that's a sign right there that they're not telling you the truth. That's right. Because things were not so happy in the good old days. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, but it is, it's, it's a very count. I'm, I'm glad you said that thing about counterintuitiveness because it is, it defies our perceptions, which is why it's so hard to necessarily buy into the idea that we are living in the best of times. You're so aware of the inflation and the bills that you have piling up and the credit card debt and the kids who are having trouble in school right now, or, you know, the boss at your job who just won't give you a break, you know, and all these things that you're so hyper aware of in your own personal life. And you go best of times you out of your fucking mind, you know, and then you look at the news that you turn on at six o'clock and it's doom and gloom piled on with, uh, you know, more oppressive doom and gloom. And you think this is crazy. We've never lived in crazier times, but that's where we really need to step back and recognize the humanity in one another and 
the fact that no, it's actually kind of going up, not down. You know, this is the same logic as the flat earthers use. Well, you can see it's flat. <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> How is this a question? Look, you know, it's flat. <laughs> and you go, okay, okay. You got to step a little back, you know. <laughs> uh, do you see, so that all being said, beyond Pinker's work and this kind of stuff, do you see um, things right now, you know, uh, from a his, maybe from a historical perspective that should be, that we should be focusing or concentrating on that might help? in our daily lives with, you know, maintaining some hope and optimism. Um, I'm asking the guy who wrote the politics of fear. So maybe, maybe I'm asking. No, I, I, I may not be the, per you know, I, my, my gift is, I hope is to make people think uh -huh. um, there are, there are people that are so much more inspiring than me. And those are the people you should listen to. On that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I, I, I would, I, I, I can't, I, I I don't have a formula, but I um. But try to get past your bad feelings is all I'll say. You know, I I have bad feelings. I'm 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 not immune to all this stuff, right. um, and you know, part of the reason I said at the beginning of the show I thought it would be fun to write about cults, conspiracies, and secret societies is because I was drawn to it. Yeah. You know, I'm skeptical about the world and. I, I liked, you know, I liked reading about flying saucers. I liked reading super left-wing conspiracy stuff. I, I, um, I grew up in the Vietnam era. There was plenty to be cynical about. Um, but beware of things that tell you that your enemies are not human. Just beware of those things. That's because... You know, the, this is the most, I, again, I don't pay that much attention to Trump's rhetoric on a day-by-day -day basis because I know it's just confidence man stuff. It's whatever, it's whatever's working that day. But he's starting to talk about how people, you know, these immigrants aren't really people. And that's the most horrible thing you can hear. That's right. And you, you, the, the, the idea that, that, we would be letting somebody that says that come within miles of a responsible position, never mind the most responsible position, is, is just horrifying to me. Yeah. Yeah. Re rem exactly. Remember that people are people. Exactly. Exactly. I think I, I really do. I think that I think that it, we've come down to such simplicities, um, you know, the kind of things that we teach our children. And we need to remind ourselves. I mean, whoever said adults had it all figured out? <laughs> Sometimes we got to go back to basics. Um, okay. I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today and go over all of this stuff. I think we've had an interesting conversation. I've enjoyed it very much. Excellent. Me too. So thank you for this time. Thank I, you. you um, I, wanted, I want you to tell my audience, how do people find your work and find you if they want to reach out to you personally? Um, I have a website that's new and not that functional yet called arthurgoldwag.com. So um, I don't have an easy name to remember, but if you spell it right, it'll get you there. I have a pretty big footprint on the internet. If you just do my name, you'll, you'll get there. Um, my books can all be purchased presumably in bookstores, but I wouldn't bet on it, but you can certainly get them from Penguin Random House or Amazon or any of the any of the big online people. Mm -hmm. um, and I do answer emails. I answer letters. I'm happy to hear from people. I um, I brace myself for hate, but I, I can deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <it's> uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, ArthurGoldwag.com will be linked in the show notes below here on YouTube and on my podcast site. So you, I, and I've checked out your site. There's lots of good fun stuff there. Check it out. The, the books that he's written are fascinating and interesting and they are well written. I will attest to that. I, I definitely have enjoyed reading your work. 
Uh, it is factful, and I appreciate that. It is easy to become sensationalistic. Let me just say, it is very easy to get sensationalistic with this stuff and get salacious and get into all the you know horrible stuff. And you don't do that, at least not from what I've read of what you've put together. And I really appreciate that as somebody who has been working in this you know, sort of very niche field for a long time is it tends to only get attention when, you know, there's something sexy to talk about. But the fact of the matter is that the entire, you know, situation in our country right now has everything to do with this information, mm -hmm. you know? So I encourage everybody to check out Arthur's work. Um, did you have any parting or last thoughts before we wrap up today? Um, I don't think so. Just thank you so much and keep doing the valuable work that you do. Well, thank you very much. You right back at you, man. And okay. uh, maybe we'll talk again. Okay. I hope so. Bye-bye. All right. All right, folks out there, um, check out Arthur's page. Subscribe to this podcast if you're not already done so. I hope that you found this uh, this episode today informative, educational, and entertaining. That is always the goal here. And of course, if you uh, are in the need for such a thing, you can contact me personally for one-on-one -on -one consultation uh, regarding cults, coercive control, um, intimate partner violence, any sort of uh, coercive situation that you might have been involved in. If you want guidance, help, direction uh, with dealing with that or moving on from it, I can help you with that. All right, guys, I will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.